Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. something so precious about the presence of, of God. You can just press into that and allow Him to minister to our hearts. He says we can come boldly before the throne room of grace. So I want to encourage us, let's develop that lifestyle, not just here on Sundays, but every morning and every afternoon, every evening, just live lives that draw near to the presence of God. After the service, we're going to worship again. And feel free just to press into the Lord's presence tomorrow evening as we come together for First Monday prayer. We're going to worship again and press into the Lord's presence. Something happens when we draw near to Him. Amen. Thank you so much, band. You guys are welcome to grab your seats. Thank you for leading us so beautifully. And spend some time at my in-laws this afternoon and came home and had to just quickly grab my stuff and, and come to church to pray before the service. And I realized I left my tablet at home. So I'm on mini screen for a mini sermon tonight. We're going to make it very interactive and get everyone involved and we're going to share some stories. How many of you guys have noticed we're story people? Humans are story people. We're, we love stories. We love listening to stories, to other people's stories, reading stories for those of us who are readers, watching stories for those of us who enjoy movies. Sports people are sort of getting on to this fact that we like stories. Um, who, here has, who here has watched sort of Drive to Survive? Any Drive to Survive people? Who watched Drive to Survive without being a Formula One fan? Any of us here? Are you a Formula One fan now, Ted? Three quarters. But there's something that happens when we connect with a story. And so Drive to Survive was sort of one of the first, some of you guys a couple of years ago may have watched the, the Rugby World Cup Chasing the Sun story. Never watched it, but apparently Russi's language is not all that glamorous. Very colorful. But there's something that happens when we get the story. It's great watching the sport, but... It's like our hearts are connected to it when we get the story. Now suddenly Formula One's got all of these new fans because they had this, these series, a couple of, I think they're in the fourth season now, of telling the story and other people have caught on to this. So my wife is a cycling fan now. Tour de France is her third thing because she watched the cycling story. And there's a golf one and there's a, a tennis one now. As People realize that when we bring the story, we engage people's hearts. God loves stories. God made us to love stories. I remember a couple of years ago, I was teaching at varsity, lecturing, and um, had a, a couple of Muslim colleagues and had the privilege of sharing with them a couple of times and gave one of them a Bible. And she actually read the Bible. And I know she read it because she came back to me a couple of weeks later and she said that she was amazed when she read it that it was mostly just stories. I think sometimes we miss that. She was expecting this book of rules and regulations and laws. And yes, there's a little bit of in that. And there's some songs and there's some poems in Scripture. But on the whole, it's stories. It's stories of people. And so this evening, I want us to think a little bit about being proclaimers of God's story. Don't quite have to re This is maybe you guys are too young for this joke, but you don't have to walk 500 miles, but... If you want to, you can. I told you, you're way too young for this joke. Many years ago, there was a band called The Proclaimers, and they sang a song that I will walk 500 miles, and I will walk 500 more. We're not talking about them tonight. And so we look at the story of, of Jesus. This year, we've been talking a lot about stepping into God's purpose. We spent some time talking about stepping into His love, and in moments like this evening, we we have a moment just where we can step into God, into His love, into His acceptance, into 
knowing that what we do isn't unimportant, but it's irrelevant because of what Jesus has done. It's far more important what Jesus has done than what you and I will ever do. We step into this place of of His love for us, which reaches from never-ending to never-ending. And then for the last couple of months specifically, we've been speaking about purpose and stepping into the purpose of God. A part of that conversation has been the realization that the prayer of God, what is your purpose with Philip? What is Philip's purpose is fundamentally a wrong prayer. God, what is your purpose for my life? What is my purpose? Those are fundamentally wrong questions. The the right question is to step into what theologians would call the missio dei, the mission of God, God's mission. See, the question isn't, what is God's purpose for this church? Because God doesn't have a purpose for this church. God has a church for His purpose. God's purpose supersedes church. God's purpose was around long before church was around. Because God has a purpose, He brought the church to be, to bring forth His purpose. And so for you and me to step into what God's plan and God's purpose is for our lives, the first thing we have to do is embrace His purpose. To say, God, what is your plan? Before I begin to ask, what is your plan for me? God, what is your plan? And as we begin to embrace God's plan and we begin to realize perhaps a little bit different to what the Western world wants us to believe, that it's not God's plan for me, it's God's plan. When I begin to realize God's plan, I can begin to step into, okay, how does my role within that plan look? How do I contribute to God's plan? How do I get on board with God's plan? And so we've been spending a little bit of time talking about that. And I want us to pick up the story around that this evening. And we're going to look at Jesus in Luke chapter 4. The start of Luke chapter 4 is a pivotal time in Jesus' life. Maybe just rewind a little bit for a couple of verses where in the middle of Luke chapter 3, Jesus gets baptized. He goes down into the water, which is what baptism is. The very word means submersion. So Jesus is submersed, he's immersed, he's under the water and he comes up out of the water having been baptized. In that moment, something so beautiful happens. It's like we we see the Trinity manifesting itself. In that moment, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. The Father looks down from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In that moment, we have such a significant moment happening in Jesus' life because Jesus steps into being the Christ. I was sharing this morning that Jesus is quite a common name in, in the Hebrew environment and the Hebrew culture. It was very much back then in Scripture. We read about some other Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, I'm not sure what the plural of Jesus would be. And so there's Jesus. Imagine Jesus as a little kid and he, he goes maybe to the playgroup or to the school or he's in the rugby team and he's playing. Just as an aside, can you imagine being Jesus' brother? The guy who never does anything wrong. You have to sort of try and and live up to that. So anyway, there's Jesus. And Jesus is in this environment. And what Jesus' name very definitely would not have been is Jesus Christ. He would have been Jesus by Joseph, Jesus' son of Joseph. That's how they would have referred to him. And so often I grew up with this idea in the back of my mind that Christ is his surname. Sort of his name is Jesus Christ. And it's not his surname at all. It's something far more powerful and something far more important. If you'd call him Jesus Christ when he was at school, when he was a little one growing up, you would most likely have been in very, very deep trouble to the point of death. Would have been the worst form of blasphemy that one can commit because we use this word in the New Testament a lot, Christ, which comes from the Greek Christos, and in the Old Testament, there's an exactly equivalent word, which we speak, say, in English, Messiah. I'm not going to try the Hebrew pronunciation for that. And so in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, we have this Messiah, the promised one, the one who is to come, the one who will deliver, who will set free, the one who is empowered by the Holy Spirit, the one on whom the Holy Spirit rests. That's what this idea means, the anointed one, the chosen one. So the Hebrew, the word would be, the equivalent would be Messiah. The exact same concept in Greek would be Christ. 
And so nobody would ever dare to call any person the Christ because that would be blasphemous in the highest regard. That would be saying that this is God's chosen one. And so Jesus, as he was growing up, no one would ever have referred to him as the Christ. It would have been the furthest thing from anyone's imagination to refer to any human as the Christ because of the the prophetic promise that that entails. And so what happens is in this moment when Jesus is baptized and he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. It's not a dove that comes and sits on his head like some of our, our children's Bibles and pictures say. It's not that at all. Scripture says the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus, and then the author says, kind of trying to make it tractable for us like a dove. It's a, a physical thing that came up out of, came down from heaven and descended upon Jesus' being. And in that moment, Jesus stepped into the office of the Christ. He'd always had that in an eternal sense, in the Son of God sense. But in that moment, in His humanity, He stepped into being filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. And the Father looks down and says, My Son, in whom I am well pleased, listen to Him. And then the end of Luke chapter 3, we've got a a genealogy. And then we pick up the story in Luke chapter 4. And I think four times in the next 16 verses, we see these phrases, depending on your translation, something along the lines of Jesus led by the Spirit, Jesus in the power of the Spirit, Jesus sent by the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We see four times within the next 16 verses, just confirmation that something has shifted in Jesus' life. That's where we pick up the story. Jesus has just gone into the desert. He was tempted by the devil. He comes out of the desert. He goes back to his town, Nazareth. And Sorry, this small screen is not quite working as well as I wanted it to. And he came to Nazareth and where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up and read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and... He found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I'm reading from the new, sorry, the ESV tonight. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. What we see here is Jesus filled with the Spirit, the Christ, coming out of the desert, about to start his ministry here on earth. And he says, for the next three years, it's a little bit of a vision statement, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be doing a bunch of stuff. I'm going to be setting an example of what ministry for the rest of this earth age would look like. And in this translation, three times we have proclaim. Jesus came to proclaim. He came to proclaim the gospel. He came to proclaim liberty. He came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There the are different words used in, in the Greek um, and different translations which sort of focus on different things. There's exagalo. We're not going to get into the Greek too much tonight. There's keruso. There's eulasio. And they all have sort of a, a different focus and a A little bit of a different nuance, but they're words which are very well understood. And they're well understood for a couple of reasons. They're well understood because they are words that are used a lot. See, in in Bible translation and in historic texts, the challenge is when there are words that are used very infrequently, it's sort of hard to figure out exactly what that word means. A word that's in an ancient text that we have to try and from its context figure out what does this word mean. That's a little bit tricky and open to a lot of interpretation. But words that are used a lot in Scripture and words translated in in the ESV as proclaimed, we find 71 times in the Old Testament, 72 times in the New Testament is a lot. And then there's a lot of context and it becomes quite clear what these specific words mean. But not only are they found in Scripture a lot, These words are found throughout Greek literature. Most of them we find even in Iliad's Homer, which is sort of a fundamental text in in Greek study. Way before Scripture, you get these stories that were written in Greek, and these words appear all the time. We know exactly what these words mean. 
got a very good understanding of, of these words and something that is unique despite their slight nuances to every single one of them is every single one of them involve some form of public declaration. They all talk about something public, some, de some declaration, some announcement, literally as we would say in English, some proclamation out loud, publicly. Some of you may have heard a, um, a saying that says, apparently it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, just a moment, I'll clarify that, but something along the lines of preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Who's heard that before? A couple of us have heard it and sort of, say, for some reason it's infiltrated Christian sort of speak quite a lot. Interesting, there's absolutely no record of St. Francis of Assisi ever saying or writing that, so it was likely most likely didn't come from him. But I heard someone sort of equate that a, a while ago, saying, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. It's a little bit like saying, feed the hungry, and if necessary, use food. You see, preaching the gospel, yes, there's example. Yes, we should live our, our lives, and our actions should testify to and be in agreement with our words, but we can't get away from preaching. And sometimes we like using texts like that. We say, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to use words. And yet the text so clearly speaks about proclamation, which involves a public announcement, a declaration, putting it out there in a way that some people can hear. You see, the scriptural mandate never suggested a way in which we should live our lives to testify to Jesus absent and disconnected from vocalizing the same and verbalizing the same. If you look at sort of an English dictionary, Oxford Dictionary as an example, you'll, you'll find words of proclamation, something along the line, the line, let me try that again, something along the lines of to announce officially or publicly, to say something emphatically, to declare, to indicate clearly. My daughter's really into stars and universe and sort of everything out there a little bit. And so a couple of weeks ago, some of you may know there was a really interesting astrological phenomenon, which apparently doesn't astronomical phenomenon, which doesn't happen apparently too often and too regularly. But it um, there was Saturn was really close to the moon. Did any of you guys see that? Know about that type of thing? And so my my you know how grandmas are. My mom she hears about this, she reads about it, and she sends my daughter on our family WhatsApp group sort of via as parents a, a message, Lisa, you must watch the moon tonight because there's this thing that's happening, and Lisa's only response was, I know, I've been waiting for this the whole year. Um, <laughs> I'm clued up on this, I've got my telescope, I'm ready, we gave her a little telescope for her birthday, she's ready, and it was pretty cool, you could see the rings on Saturn, and it was a really, really cool moment. But the crazy thing about the universe and some of you may have watched sort of Louis Giglio. There's a great message around this. I'm not going to try and replicate kind of the, the way in which he, he brings something of the glory of God out in, in the universe. But I just want to remind us that, you know, the universe is, is pretty big. It's so big kind of when you and I drive, we measure things in kilometers. Distance is in kilometers. How far can I go? Well, it's five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 50 kilometers. When you start going in, into space, you don't measure kilometers. Just as an aside, does anybody know how far space is away from us right now? From here to space, how long? If you got in your car and you were to drive vertically from here to space, how long would it take? Less than an hour. The definition of space is 100 kilometers from sea level. And so from kind of from above that, that we, we start going out and we start going further, we start measuring in light years. In other words, the time that it takes light or the distance that light travels in one year. The speed of light for one year is one light year. And so we have things like the sun, which is really, really close. It's like eight light minutes away. It takes eight minutes for the light to travel from the sun to where we are. But then very quickly you start measuring in thousands and millions of light years. That's how far things are. And every now and again some clever guy or organization brings about a bigger telescope and a better telescope. We've got one sort of in the Karoo 
Do you guys know that? We've got a, it's a square kilometer array. That's a pretty big telescope. And it's partnered with an equivalent, and a partner one in Australia, in one of their deserts. And those two sort of work together to give us these pictures of what's going up in the heavens. And every now and again, we build a bigger one and a better telescope. And all that shows us is that this universe is even bigger than we thought. And we see more things and we see great things and kind of these beautiful astronomical things that kind of just that are out there, like quasars and other random weird stuff that if you have a very cool telescope, you could look at. And it's amazing. We see the photos of these things. I remember someone saying, uh, you know why it is so big and so huge? I mean, some of these, these quasars and stuff, they're like millions of light years across, just like one astronomical thing. It's like a million light years from top to bottom. And kind of we look at it, take a photo of it. It's just crazy. It just blows your head. It makes your head go like boom when you start thinking into this stuff. We can't measure it. It's just too big. It goes beyond what we can begin to figure out. And I love what someone said. It can't be any different. Psalm 16 tells us the purpose of the universe. I'm sorry, Psalm 91 verse 1 tells us why the universe exists. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. There is a proclamation all the time that our stars, that the heavens, that everything a billion of a billion of a billion light years away is figuring out. Here's a little crazy thought. You know, every time you look at a star, you're looking back in time. Because it's a thousand or whatever light years away, the light you're seeing now is light that started its journey a thousand Years ago, and you're looking back into time, into that thing that happened way back. But it's just this crazy expanse we can never begin to imagine, and its sole purpose is to declare the glory of God so it cannot be small. If we were able to contain it, if we were able to manage it, if we were able to fully describe it, that means we would be able to do the same to the glory of God, but you can't. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. So we've got these heavens. We see Jesus coming and, and His purpose largely involved proclaiming. The heavens have been created and their purpose is to proclaim. But then watch this in First Peter chapter 2, and I need to go a lot quicker. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. And that's such a great description of who we are as children of God. Some translations would speak about a, um, a chosen generation, the people that God smiles over, that He's picked, that He's brought. We are His. But watch what carries on. He says, there is a reason why we are a chosen nation, a chosen race. It's so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. See, you have been chosen to be part of this special, special people of God, this generation of God, this holy nation, this royal priesthood of God. Why? So that you can proclaim His excellencies. You can proclaim the excellencies of Him who took you out of darkness and, and into His marvelous light. You're a proclaimer. You have been shaped and formed part of your purpose on this earth, just like part of the purpose of some quasar a gazillion light years away that we haven't even learned and looked upon yet. Why does it exist? It exists to declare and to proclaim the glory of God. The same reason why you exist. To proclaim something of the excellencies of God. And so I want us for a moment to get really practical. I'm going to ask us, to probably move our chairs a little bit and to form groups of maybe four or five people, not more than five, otherwise this is going to take a little bit too long. So maybe you need to get up, turn your chair around, say to someone that you probably wouldn't normally spend a lot of time talking to, groups of four or five. And if you're a little bit uncomfortable, kind of it's new, it's weird, I know, but trust us for a moment, you'll be okay. Thank you. If we can maybe just do that, take a moment, find someone, introduce yourself, here we go. Gandhi's got the vision. Uh, let's move around. Find a group, four, maybe five people. 
No bigger than that, please. Awesome. If you need to introduce yourself, well, police, Palesa, we need to work on your maths. Don't want to be difficult, just we're not going to have time for everyone. Awesome. If you all introduce yourself, say, hi, my name is, if you need to do that. And then a strange thing kind of, we need to change this in our culture. The second question after we've said what my name is, we say what my function is, what I do in life. How sad is that? My name is, I work this, I do that, I study there. Surely there's more important stuff than our function that we fulfill. Anyway, that is completely besides the point. Let's not get sidetracked. I want us for just a moment to tell some stories, our stories. The story that I want us to think about this evening is a, a story in, in two sections. So you're gonna, I'm going to give you just sort of two minutes to think about this, and then I'm going to give you give group 15 minutes as a group to give everyone a chance. So you know you get the, the original Lord of the Rings novel, which is I don't know how many thousand pages, and then you get the Reader's Digest condensed version. Tonight we're doing the Reader's Digest condensed version. The, the full version is so much better. It is amazing. Read it. But maybe just for tonight, we don't quite have seven hours to listen to the whole story as much as we would love to. So we're going to do the two and a half minute version. Okay. Can we do that? Two things that I want you just to think of. The first one is if you look back at your life, when you first decided to follow Jesus, why? What was going on in your life? Why did you initially decide to follow Jesus? And then secondly, why did you choose to continue to follow Jesus? So there was a time, a moment where I was like, I probably need Jesus in my life. I, I had this moment and kind of, this Jesus thing is a good thing. I'm going to begin to follow him. And then for most of us, there was probably another moment at some stage where we realized, I'm going to continue doing this. I'm in this for the long haul. Okay. So it's 20 past now. Can we kind of, I'm going to give you guys... My math's brain has just left me until 22, 18 minutes for your whole group. So you need to kind of self-manage your time. I'm not going to say, okay, next person and be the buzzer. Okay, share a little bit those two questions. Why did you initially decide to follow Jesus? Your story around that. Why did you continue to follow him? Awesome, let's go. So what you guys have just shared with one another is a, a part of what sort of in, in Christian parlance and Christian language we would call your testimony, your story. Part of us being a proclaimer is us embracing story, embracing testimony and, and sharing it. You don't always have to share the whole thing, but just four very quick tips I want to give us is we're going to be proclaimers, proclaiming the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's part of His purpose for us. If, if we really want to embrace that, just four little things that I want to, just tips I want to give you that testimony is not. The first thing is, and kind of that's one of the ways I, I phrase it this way, because if we phrase it this way, we, it's a little bit less intimidating for some of us. If I'd asked us to share a testimony, we probably would have shared a little bit different. So a couple of things that testimony definitely is not. Testimony is not how good I am. When someone leaves having heard your testimony, they shouldn't leave saying, well, Philip is so cool. If I've done that, then I've missed the whole point. The takeaway from me sharing a story should be Jesus is so cool. This is a, a slight shift in, in how we proclaim. You see, if I, if I proclaim and I say, guys, this is what I was, and I, was kind of, I did all of this, and I got involved in all of these really, really bad decisions, and then I got my life back together, and I sorted it out, and I started praying, and I, now I'm going to church, and I'm in a small group, and I'm leading in my church, then the main character in that story is me. It's missing the point. If the story is I was in a bad way, and I made some shocking decisions, and, and really wasn't doing well. But Jesus, 
Jesus came and he turned my heart. Jesus came and he changed the way I relate to people. Jesus came and he, he showed me a better way. Jesus came and he lifted me up from the nonsense that I was in and he gave me opportunities. The focus of the story is Jesus. So the first thing that we just want to be aware of is I don't want to be the main character in the story because of how good I am. What I also don't want to be is the main character in the story because of how bad I am. We sometimes want to step into the trap of kind of exaggerating how bad I was to try and make God look a little bit better. You know, I was in a three-meter deep hole, but we say it was a four-meter deep hole because that's just more God to get me out of a four-meter deep hole than a three-meter deep hole. I've listened to some stories and testimonies of how, how people kind of spend so much talking about how bad they were instead of how good Jesus is. And so we want to keep the focus on who God is. Yes, I'm a mess up. I'm bad, but I'm not more bad than you ever will be or have been. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not more bad than I am, and I'm not more bad than you are. But God is good. And so when you just keep that as a focus, I really need to change this thing's screen off time. Okay. Um, so we want to make sure that Jesus is the hero and the, the focus of the story. The third one that I want to say is your story is not insignificant. Sometimes we, we hear the story of you know, the drug guy who was high and sort of tripping out. And in that moment, he had a vision of Jesus. And Jesus came and lifted him and delivered him in that moment. And kind of he was set free. And the demons came screaming out. And the next moment, he was sort of translocated and found in a different continent. And then we're like, wow, that's a testimony. That's going to change people's lives. And it will. And we'll tell that story. But you know, the vast majority of people that you will meet in your life cannot relate to that story because that's not their story. For the vast majority of people that you will relate to will probably relate largely to your story. The vast majority of people in Pretoria that I meet when I tell them my story because I grew up in a religious home, went to church pretty much every Sunday, didn't have a relationship with Jesus that story speaks to hearts a lot more because people can relate to it because they're there too. It doesn't take away from God's power to transform and to heal and to do the miraculous. We trust that you'll continue always to do that, but your story isn't insignificant because it's not fit for a Hollywood movie. Your story is significant because it is you. And what gives your story its power is the authenticity. What gives your story as power is it's me, it's who I am. It's what shaped and formed me to where I am today. Your story has the power to change lives. We'll see that in just a moment. And then just very important, just when we're sharing story, when we're proclaiming, there is a time and a place for preaching and for teaching. There's a time and a place for saying this is what people should do. But there's a very big difference between sharing a story and telling people what they must do. The very nature of the conversation changes very quickly from when we're sitting on a bench or we're sort of in the queue at checkers waiting to get to the front. And I'm just very quickly telling a story to some random stranger about God's goodness. And then I throw in this little temptation comes in, and now you must. The moment we throw the, and now you must, in, it's changed from a story to a sermon. Yes, there's a time and a place. Yes, if someone asks us, that's completely different. But we need to withhold that kind of that, that temptation to tell people what to do. Just tell them who Jesus is. Make them hungry to go look for Jesus. If they ask, what do I do now? Then we tell them what they do now. But it's so easy to just make that jump to say, this is what God did in my life and it was amazing and God is so cool and now you must. And right in that moment, the power of our testimony has been removed. Right in that moment, we've shifted into a different space. There is a time and a place for that type of preaching and teaching. Just be aware the cha conversation changes dramatically. The testimony, your story, doesn't always have to be the whole story. We can just like now, just the highlights packaged. Sometimes it's not even how we came to faith. It's just I went through a moment in my life and Jesus was there. 
And that can lift someone else's spirit. That can build faith. That can point someone to Jesus. Not only did Jesus come as one who was called to proclaim. Not only are you and I chosen to walk in His footsteps to proclaim. We have been commissioned. We have been sent to proclaim. Normally when we think of the Great Commission Scriptures, we look at Matthew 28. Look at the wording that we find here in Mark 16. Jesus said to His disciples, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news to the whole creation. You have been commissioned. You have been sent. We spoke about the mission, the mission day. God being the sent one, Jesus being sent. God always being one who is sending, and God has sent you. Whether you realize it or not, hopefully you realize it now tonight. You can't ever say, I didn't know. God has sent you. He said, go and proclaim. You've been commissioned by God to proclaim. In the book of Revelation, we see some, some beautiful, once again, story that sort of brings, down, brings out so many truths. And what's happening here is there's a guy called John. He's um, on an island called Patmos. He's been sort of, what's the word? He's in exile on the island, chased away from, he's just preaching Jesus too much. They need to get rid of this guy. So they put him on an island. And on this island, he has his vision. He sees these pictures and he's sort of this dream that he's involved in and it's God speaking to him, showing him firstly who Jesus is because primarily we need to remind ourselves that the first sentence of the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The main thrust of Revelation isn't to tell us about stuff that is to come, it's to show us who Jesus is. And so then he sees these pictures and then there's this, he sees this sort of this movie in a sense playing out in, in the spirit, and there's at one stage this big war. There's Michael, the archangel, and he's got all of these angels on his side. And then there's the devil called a dragon in the story, and his angels or the demons that are with him. And there's this big war, and Michael wins fantastic, as if there was going to be another outcome. And he casts down the angel, the devil, and his angels to the earth. And then there's a sort of this moment where Mankind is engaging with the dragon and his angels. And we pick up here in Revelation 12, 11, And it says, and they have conquered him. And that's these, these people, the followers of God, they conquered this dragon by the blood of the Lamb. We're going to take communion in a moment. And by the word of their testimony, by their proclamation. For they love not their lives even unto death. There is proclamation. There is power. Your proclamation is a weapon. So not only does our proclamation have the ability to stir faith in others to point us to Jesus, our proclamation is a weapon in the Spirit. You see, we overcome by two things, the blood and our word. Yes, the word of God underpinning all of that, but our proclamation of who God is, our testimony, our story. There is a power in your story that I want you to embrace this evening to know that in the Spirit something shifts when we begin to embrace our story. People's lives get set free. There is something that just moves in the dimension of the Spirit when we embrace story, telling story, God's story. So much more I could say about that, but uh, this evening I want to ask Bega, she's at the back there already, if she could pass out the elements of communion, maybe Darlington, if you could just quickly help there. Because there's another way in which we proclaim. You see, we proclaim with our words, we proclaim with our mouths, we proclaim by telling. I asked this question this morning. How many of us, there's World Cup going on? If, you, if you've missed that, ladies, there's a World Cup, that's why Mark's wearing a green shirt here, Okay. In the last two weeks, how many of us have had a conversation about rugby? Spoken to someone about something to do with rugby, even if we're not rugby people. We probably had a conversation about rugby. Not too many of us here have two children, but how many of us have had conversations about the other important people in our lives? In the last two weeks, most of us, we've probably had a conversation about the people that are dear to our hearts. 
I wonder how many of us in the last two weeks have had a conversation about Jesus with someone. Something so simple, but it, it's something that has shifted away from who we are as people. Maybe perhaps we grew up with this idea that, you know, my, you don't talk about religion, my faith, that's, that's private. And there's an element of truth to that, but at the same time, that's one of the most powerful lies the enemy has sold into our hearts, is that we don't proclaim. We don't tell about Jesus because it's private. And yes, certainly there are things that God is doing in my life that is private and that's intimate. This is a beautiful parallel. I'm away for a conference this week, all week, and you know, if I come back, At the end of the week, and the people that I've met with, and people that kind of I engaged with a little bit during the week, don't know that I'm married because it's private. Something is wrong about my relationship with my wife. Yes, it's private. They don't have to know what's going on intimately between my wife and I, but it's not so private that they don't know it exists. On the contrary, the fact that I'm married is public. What happens between us is private. The fact that I'm following Jesus is not private. That should be public. Maybe perhaps the things that I'm wrestling through with God, those are private. To an extent, because Scripture calls us to walk in accountability, to walk in the light. Scripture calls us to proclaim. We have to step away from the lie that says my relationship with Jesus is private, so I don't talk about it, because it's exactly what Jesus didn't say. He said, the one thing I want you to do about your relationship with me, I'm paraphrasing here, is talk about it. Tell others about me. Tell them what I'm doing. Tell my story. And then we get to the one way is we proclaim with our mouths. And then in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church and he says, For I received from the Lord, from Jesus, that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then watch verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, every time we engage in the Lord's Supper, there's something in the Spirit that happens. There's something about a testimony that is being proclaimed. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be in the streets, we shouldn't be around dinner, we shouldn't be around lunch, we shouldn't be around colleagues testifying there as well. We definitely should do there. But there is something that happens when we engage around the Lord's table, around His Supper. We proclaim His death in the Spirit. So can we stand this, this evening? Maybe just one more thing that I want to drop with you, just perhaps as a, you can stand so long while you, before we pray. Something that I've learned in life is it's very hard to change behavior and achieve goals without being intentional. It's very hard. It's very hard to accidentally change our behaviors in a good way. So if you're sensing God is stirring in your heart that, hey, I'm a proclaimer, but I haven't really been proclaiming. Maybe perhaps put out your faith and say, God, maybe start this week, this week now that starts tonight. So by next week, Sunday, God, I want to have at least one Jesus conversation with somebody who doesn't know you. Just put that out there. No one is going to crucify you or be upset with you. No one's going to be angry with you if it doesn't. But I also know that kind of, this is my ankle situation that I'm going in. If, if I don't have a goal that I'm working towards, if I don't have a time where I need to be able to, hopefully in my case, run a race, although the doctor isn't very happy about that idea right now, um, I'm, I'm not going to be diligent in my training. I'm not going to work hard. I have a pastor friend who a couple of years ago was in a, in a phase where, a phase of time, a season where God has just stirred in his heart to every day lead five people to Christ. Every day. So he was telling us, just as an aside, he was literally just telling us a story. It was a really humble, really beautiful conversation. But he was saying about the previous day how it was 11 at night and he was about to go to bed and he realized today it had only been four. 
And so how he went into the street and he had a beautiful conversation and was able to lead someone to Christ because he just, he was deliberate about doing something. So I want to encourage you, be deliberate. Say, God, every day or once a week or whatever it is, wherever your faith is at, God, I want to have at least one conversation with somebody. If I don't put that goal out there, it's probably not going to change. If I put that goal out there, hey, maybe when I go to the cafeteria over lunch, I need to speak to someone this week still. So I'm going to be a little bit more alert. Hey, there's someone sitting alone. Let me go and sit next to them, see if I can direct the conversation towards Christ. So maybe just as an aside, put that out there for yourself. No one is going to check up with you on it. No, but just, hey, if I want to embrace this being a proclaimer, let me start proclaiming. Let me start trusting God for opportunities to proclaim. Amen. Does that make sense? Like, let's pray together. Jesus, tonight I want to thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you have called, chosen, anointed, commissioned us to be proclaimers, Lord. That every single person in this room who's had an encounter with your grace, you have called us to be proclaimers of that grace, Lord. To be able to testify and to share what we've experienced. And so even tonight, Lord, we want to proclaim your death, Lord. You say every time we eat and every time we drink, we proclaim your death. And so tonight, Lord, even as we do that, we just commit our hearts. We bring our hearts before you that we may become proclaimers, Lord. We want to live as proclaimers. Go out every day as proclaimers of Christ. Because we have been called for that. We have been chosen and saved. We are a chosen generation, a holy priesthood, a royal nation, Lord. So that we may proclaim. So right now, God, as much as we proclaim in the Spirit by eating and drinking in our hearts, we choose to be proclaimers. Maybe if God stirred in your heart just something while I was sharing and throughout this evening and you just want to respond before we eat and drink together, I just want to give you a moment to do that. There's a conversation that you need to have between you and God, something that you just need to commit to, that you hear Him saying, and you're saying, God, I I hear you're saying that, Lord. I'm going to embrace that. You just respond right now where you're at. And say, Jesus, thank you for your body, Lord. Thank you that as your body was broken, you defeated every power of Satan, Lord. Every chain, every shackle that holds us back, Lord God, every piece of brokenness, you've come to put it back together again, Lord. That as we proclaim your death, Lord, we also proclaim your resurrection and your hope and your life. Let's eat together. And Jesus, thank you for your blood, which washes and which cleanses, Lord, that we can come freely to your throne room of grace tonight because you have washed us, Lord, because your blood is enough, Jesus. No matter our sin, Lord, and our depravity and how far we are or have been from you, it is not further than your blood can fetch us from and wash us from, Lord. And so tonight again, We just thank you for the washing of the blood of Jesus, Lord. And we choose to proclaim the power of the blood of Jesus, Lord. We will proclaim it with our lips. We want to proclaim it with our lives, Lord. And we want to proclaim it into the Spirit, Lord, over Pretoria and over Hatfield, Lord, over our community and suburb where we stay, God. We proclaim Jesus, your blood over our lives and over our friends and over our workplaces and over our classrooms. We proclaim your blood right now in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Jesus, thank you that tonight as we leave from here, we leave changed, Lord. Because your spirit changes us. We leave because we've met with you, God, and your word has gripped some part of our heart. God, I thank you that as we leave from here tonight, we leave as proclaimers of the good news of Jesus Christ. 
pray that you would lead every one of us in that and what that looks like in our lives, God, but that we may truly live as proclaimers. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.org.